Tonight, we look at the story that has been told about the murder of John Benet Ramsey and why so many think her parents guilty and what this tells us about the America she so briefly lived in. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 23 in the ongoing series. Today we're going to go through the evidence lists and also the search warrants. And we're going to focus in particular on one particular item of evidence, the book Mindhunter by John Douglas, the esteemed FBI profiler. We're also going to look at some of the early sexual paths, I guess, or lines of inquiry that the investigators went down and why this actually scuppered the investigation. In other words, they didn't know it, but they were, they were leading themselves down a blind alley. After 22 episodes, I think it's time that we sort of ask the question, you know, why are we even paying attention to this case? It's 24 years old. The people that have been commenting saying case closed, it's obvious who did it, all that kind of thing. I'll tell you why. The reason is we want to be able to see, we want to be able to test ourselves whether we're able to know the reality of something. And it's especially something that is... 10 years old or 20 years old or 25 years old, do we actually know what happened given all the amount of scrutiny? And my answer would be no, that there's a lot that we don't know. There's a lot that despite so much um, attention, so much information, we still don't know actually what happened. And this is a way to test ourselves, ourselves into seeing what our ability is to our stamina to find the truth, to pursue justice, right? Now, I've sat in on a couple of trials, and I can tell you it takes a heck of a lot of patience, perseverance, determination, and stamina to sit through a trial, to sift through all the evidence, to sift through the one narrative, then the defense narrative, then the counter narrative, to go through all of that information, to basically just sit with something, one thing, up to the bitter end and most people don't have that kind of um, patience or strength to do that and you might say well it's not really important you know who cares well we it's now 24 years later so the John Bernay Ramsey case happened you know a long time ago it's 24 years later and we're now in a world where it's almost a free-for-all where when you google something you're going to get the information you want not the information you need not the facts, but something that an algorithm is predicting that you're going to want to hear. And that is not uh, truth. That is not reality. And in a world where this is going on, it becomes more and more important to have at least a community of people who can think, just think, think for themselves, not sort of parrot something that they've seen somewhere else, discern, think logically, infer into it and all that kind of thing. And there's that side, and then there's the far end of this, that spectrum, which is conspiracy theory, hysteria, um, histrionics, emotional thinking, and all that kind of thing. And um, true crime kind of offers us a, an opportunity to figure other people out, not demonize them, not judge them, but look at people and say, I think that th this is what is going on here. And if we can do that with other people, maybe we stand a chance of doing that in a, a true way for ourselves. And we can kind of create an authentic community. The Ramsey case is quite a good example where everyone projects their own bias into it. So you might have had a strange experience or weird experience with your father or with a male figure. And so John Ramsey did it. Or you had a domineering mother or a mother who was superficial or something. Patsy did it, or this or that, and so on and so on. And so um, even if you're very sure in this case, in the Ramsey case, of, of what went on, chances are you're not on the right track. You are on the right track in the Ramsey case when you kind of admit it's very difficult to see what's going on here. And the way that True Crime Rocket Science has approached this case isn't to point fingers at who did it or exactly what happened, although that is necessary. It's to point fingers at 
what is false, what is not the case, and to kind of exclude um, pageantry and cover-ups and misdirection. So in other words, by a process of elimination, where do you end up? Does that make sense? And we need that same kind of patience and discernment and calm, reasoned, logical thinking in modern society on subjects, important subjects like the coronavirus, important subjects like what happens after an election when people don't agree, what happens when you belong to a community or country that doesn't want to be part of a large uh, market or something, and half the people don't agree with that kind of thing. What do you do when you disagree with someone else? And social media has created a reptilian aspect to us where we don't think. We just either like something or we don't. We block something or we follow something. And there needs to be a bit of a more subtle kind of middle road where you can tolerate dissenting opinions. You can consider things that you either don't agree with or, or, or things that potentially... Um, interfere with or challenge your point of view because the the um, alternative is tyranny a tyranny of the right a tyranny of my way or the highway a tyranny of populism so you know it's one thing to say this it's one thing to say this and intellectually we can all agree with what you're talking about but I want to test you guys on this and show you like demonstrate it in a practical way, where this kind of thinking actually takes you, right? So what I'm going to first do is I'm going to present you with a scenario and and I'm going to give you a couple of episodes to think about it, maybe one or two episodes, and then we're going to talk about it. And it's basically, I'm going to show you about five or six slides and then the question is, the question I want to ask you is, are you able to essentially solve the, the Ramsey case just looking at these slides? And the slides you've seen before, but what I want you to do, perhaps for the first time, is think for a few minutes, look at pictures and think about them, use your imagination, use your logic, use your common sense, use your knowledge of the case, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. I might do this as a, a live, but um, it's something that I think is quite important. Are you ready? So if you are listening to this video on YouTube, you're listening to it, you're not watching it. I want to ask you to pay attention now to the pictures. I'm also going to put a link to this little video clip in the description. You're welcome to watch it as many times as you want. But what I'm telling you is in this little segment is basic basically the broad solution to the Ramsey case okay are you ready you know it's been said that only a midget can get down into this grate well I'm no midget and I'll show you how easily it can be done difficult coming in that window and often a yeah, burglar or an intruder if they find a safe way in they also figure it'll be a safe way out so as I've said the basic solution to the Ramsey case lies in that exact demonstration juxtaposed to the photos that I've shown you and we're going to deal with that in subsequent episodes. So think about it, think about it in a focused way, and then also think about it in a sort of long-term way. Come back to the idea a couple of times and then see what you come up with. You are more than welcome to leave your comments in the, in the comment section under this video for the time being. So before we get started with the evidence section, if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. So the first section I want to bring your attention to is the discussion around the torch or I guess what you guys call the flashlight, the softball bat, baseball bat and all that kind of thing. So what I want to just demonstrate to you guys really quickly 
is that the um, the front part of the flashlight was shown to be a, a perfect fit. That's quote unquote perfect fit for the fracture, the skull fracture, that, with that area where the skull actually sort of crushed inwards. That is along the eight and a half inch fracture line. That that this the um, I'm not sure if it's called the flange, but it's the 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 lens part of the torch of the flashlight actually fits into that um, indentation perfectly. And as a result, a lot of people thought, oh, it's definitely the flashlight that caused this inju injury. Um, I dispute that, um, and I'll tell you why. And again, this is the difference between uh, common sense, logical thinking, true crime rocket science, basically, and the rest. If John Bonet had been hit on the skull by with a torch, with a flashlight, you would expect the glass, the lens, and the also the the bulb of the um, flashlight to be damaged. Th those are very fragile. Um, what do you call it? Um, it's very, very. It's the most fragile part of a flashlight. The 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 lens, that sort of mirror surface on the inside and the that sort of bulb and yet there was nothing wrong with the flashlight there's nothing wrong with it now that's not absolute evidence that it wasn't used but if you add to that the fact that there were no hairs found on the flashlight there was no fingerprints found on the flashlight no blood fibers nothing so again you could say well just wipe down it's not a big deal but um, if you look at another item of evidence there was there were fibers found on it and so that would lead you to believe there's more evidence linking you to that as a potential weapon than the flashlight also the flashlight was found in the kitchen and I don't think that is where the crime happened I think you're an idiot if you if you do think that I, I think you're an idiot if you think John Bonet took a piece of pineapple and a flashlight that just happened to be there for no reason was some quickly whipped out and John Bonet smashed over the head. I just think that is, that's that doesn't make any sense. So they've also had to demonstrate that you'd have to use almost maximum force if you, with with a object of that size to create that kind of injury. Not impossible, but at at the edges of the, what do you call it? At the edge of possibility, if I can put it that way. On the other hand, if you were using something like a bat, you wouldn't have to uh, use nearly as much power and you could still execute that kind of injury. And of course, the the end of that bat is about the same size, if not exactly the same size as the end of the flashlight. It's the same shape, it's the same size, and the critical difference is the the, the way that the energy is going to diffuse bear in mind it's a circular object hitting another circular object and what the skull fracture shows is that that it distributed quite easily and evenly and also that the um the object didn't create a rupture in the skin it didn't create a break in the skin it didn't create bleeding and so you've got to think there's got to be some some um object that is capable of plastic deformation now, I don't really like that, that word because as soon as you say plastic you'd say oh well, the torch is plastic but hard plastic doesn't deform hard plastic in the case of something like a torch doesn't deform when you hit hit um, hit it hit it against something else which is why you don't really get bats made out of plastic or uh, rackets um, made out of um, that kind of hard plastic. What does deform and what can deform are things like um, a bat. There's a little bit of, um, I'm talking about an aluminum bat. It, uh, there's a little bit of um, elasticity in the surface layer of it. And that's enough to create a certain amount of distributed force. Okay. Now, when we go through the crime scene photographs, the photo of the baseball bat, a black baseball bat found on the outside of the Ramsey home, 
It's image number 410. To be honest, I'm not 100% sure if that is a baseball bat. It could actually be a softball bat. Um, but this came up in the taped interview with Patsy Ramsey. Tom Haney was questioning her. This was on June the 25th, 26th, 27th of 1998. And uh, Patsy was shown a picture of this bat. And um, it was found near the butler kitchen's door. And a fiber from a carpet on the floor of the basement outside the wine cellar had been found on the bat. That is pretty critical evidence. It's not just... Um, fiber um, from anywhere in the house like the lounge or upstairs or something like that it is at a critical area it is basically um, right outside ground zero you know the wine cellar and so when Patsy was asked about it she said oh that looks like a baseball bat what is that and Trip DeMuth said that photograph was taken on the north side up by the butler kitchen door and Patsy Ramsey said, oh, really? That is unusual. That is unusual. Trip DeMuth said, why is that? Why is the bat being there unusual? And Patsy responded, well, it's not unusual for the kids to leave their stuff li lying around, but they wouldn't have it over there. It would have been, remember, all of the toys laying under the swing set it would be in that area. So that is that is very unusual. Now, it's very difficult to make sense out of what Patsy is saying here. Is she saying that, because by saying it's very unusual, she's drawing attention to that bat, isn't she? Now, why would she want to draw attention to the bat? Now, one possibility is that she might be trying to suggest that an intruder dropped the bat on his way out. And also, once again, that if the bat is outside and the bat was the murder weapon, then the bat is saying that someone from inside went outside. And so, once again, it can't be a member of the family. Also, even if it was one of the family members' bats, if, since it was taken outside, maybe it is part of the intruder's spiel, if that makes sense. I don't really buy what Patsy says about the kids would never leave their toys on that side of the house. I mean, I don't think you, you can make a bl blanket statement like that. Uh, you could argue that it 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 uh, you could make it or you couldn't, but uh, it's a strange thing. The other thing that I think you would uh, bear in mind is in the middle of the night, a neighbor heard the sound of, um, I think they said metal on the pavement or metal on the sidewalk. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that could be a couple of things. It could be something like a bicycle um, leaving the property or bicycle falling over or bicycle being loaded or unloaded, or bicycle just falling over. Or it could be something like a baseball bat thrown out of the window of the Ramsey home and landing on some of the hardened surfaces below. Or you could say an intruder um, you know, emerged through the grate and ran with the bat and then dropped it on a hard surface and forgot to leave footprints in the snow. So anyway, Patsy goes on to say nobody hardly went over there. And then DeMuth says, okay, the boys. Patsy says, run around. I, I know. DeMuth says, would they end up playing over there? Or do you know, is there any place they wouldn't go outside? Patsy says, well, you are right. There's probably no place they wouldn't go. Exactly. And then she says, but it would be highly unusual, is what I'm saying, for a baseball bat to be there. Because there's not much, there's not that much space over there. I mean, if they hit a ball and a bat, it was usually over where the patio is, that area. DeMuth says, how about the bat itself? Does that look... And then she interrupts him and says, well, I can't say for sure. Burke would probably know. DeMuth says, do you know how many bats he might have had? Would he have had more than one? Patsy says, I don't think so. I mean, I think that looks metal. Metal bats are pretty... I mean, they're not cheap. So I can't imagine... I don't think he had more than one, if he had one. So now she's saying... If he had a bat. And anyway, so Trip DeMuth goes on to say, but he, he did have one. Patsy says, it seems like he had one, but I can't say for sure it was that one. Like I said, he would know. So yeah, you have a mother who doesn't know what kind of bat her son has. A little bit like saying, I don't know if that's John Bonet's patient outfit or not. Maybe it belongs to another child. Maybe someone dropped it on the way out kind of thing. So it is pretty bizarre. She's saying maybe he would know. 
He might know if they ever played over there, but that bat seems weird to me. Yeah, very strange. So I've got an idea because of Patsy directing attention to that bat, that might not actually be the bat that was involved. If a bat was involved, it, it might be a different bat. Another thing just to point out is I'm not 100% sure that that is a bat, a, 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 a baseball bat. I think it's actually a softball bat. And the interesting thing with that is that Patsy was part of a softball team sponsored by Access Graphics, which is a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin. So can you imagine if the case went to trial and it turned out that John Bernays head was bashed in with a softball bat and the softball bat happened to Patsy? It wouldn't really matter what the details were, the news headlines would basically be that this company had sponsored a, a, a team of which one member had theoretically, suspiciously, by inference, um, by just possibly um, smashed in her daughter's head with this bat, right? It just wouldn't look good. There would be no way to sort of spin out of that. And so, anyway, Tom Haney goes on. This is uh, in the interrogation, also from June 1998. Talks about the next group of photos. He says they're not numbered, but they show a flashlight. Patsy says, uh-huh. A black metal type, uh-huh. Tom Haney, flashlight. Do you recognize that? Patsy says, it looks similar to the one that John Andrew gave John for Christmas, for his birthday or something. Tom Haney says, that's similar to the one that John Andrew gave John. Patsy says, yeah. And I think last time when you were here on last April, you said, where was that stored? He says, I want to clarify that a little bit. Do you remember where it was stored? And Patsy says, where was this flashlight found? Right? So Patsy asks the investigator, where was this flashlight found? Now, are telling me she didn't know it was there? That's the other thing is Patsy talks about, you know, she's standing looking at the ransom note and there's a flashlight kind of around the corner from her. Um, that didn't she know it was there? Anyway, um, Tom Haney says, do you remember when you came in on in, in April, they showed you a picture of the flashlight? Do you recall that? And she says, no. So she's saying, I don't remember where the flashlight was. So Tom Haney says, okay, this was on the kitchen counter. Would that be out? Now, just think about this. The possibility that Patsy wrote the ransom note, but she doesn't know anything about what's in it. That would kind of make sense if you had written the ransom note that you wouldn't remember what was in it. It doesn't make sense that a ransom note left behind by an intruder who's taken your child, you would pay no attention to. And I don't just mean on that morning. I mean up until a week later. Would you still be like, maybe we should actually read the ransom note, but maybe we'll find something out about the person who wrote it. I mean, it's not me, it's somebody else. But if it was you, would you really want it spoken about very much and we're going to talk about how that narrative changed where it's like hey there's a ransom note we have a kidnapping but let's not talk really too much about what's in the note to a different way of dealing with a ransom note where we're going to analyze every little thing i'm just saying that 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 pr narrative totally changed from being completely disinterested in what is in the note disregarding it, calling the police, um, what is the other thing? Not reading it, not touching it, not holding it, not even picking it up. None of the Rams is doing that. To obsessing over everything over it, but only after they, they'd received advice from other people, like their PR people. We're going to get to that in a moment. So anyway, Tom Haney says, this was on the kitchen counter. Why would that be out? She says, I don't know. Tom Haney, did you guys use this flashlight much? I didn't know. Who did? Patsy says, John used it. What did he use it for? I don't know. Looking in the garage and the car or something like that, but not the basement, I guess. Tom Haney, okay. Had you ever seen it on the kitchen counter before? Not that I recall. The kind of thing, the kind of statement a lawyer would make or a lawyer would say to make. Tom Haney, would it have struck you as unusual? Would that not be outside of the realm of possibilities? Patsy says, it seems like it would have been unusual to have made it all the way into the kitchen. And so Patsy's saying, wow, well, it seems quite unusual, but she'd never noticed it before. So it's almost like she wants law enforcement to notice it. 
Before we deal with the um, Mindhunter book, Mindhunter book, let's just go through very quickly some of the items mentioned and seized during the search warrant. Okay, so first of all, the body of John Bernay Ramsey. Then items recovered from the body, including green flakes, trace evidence, pieces of paper, white fiber, hair fibers, white cord, white long sleeve shirt, white long sleeve underwear bottoms, panties with a floral print, white ligature, gold colored necklace with cross, gold colored ring, gold colored bracelet, black red white hair tie, blue hair tie, and then a hair tie. Okay, so we're going to continue with that. I just want to point out a couple of things. One is that the apparent route that the abductor took was down the spiral staircase. This is according to the intruder theory. So the abductor abducted John Bonet from her bedroom. When she was woken up, she didn't scream. When she was tasered, she didn't scream. She just calmly, like Madeleine McCann, calmly went in, in the arms of a of a predator and didn't say anything, do anything. She didn't, she didn't um, fight with him um, and just was calmly removed. So the green flakes are supposedly from the Christmas tinsel, sort of wrapped around the spiral staircase. And then John Bonet was then carried down a half flight of stairs, right? And I'm, now I'm just going to play a little clip that retraces this journey. Are you ready? The intruder takes John Bonet down the spiraled steps leading from her bedroom. Where was the ransom note found? Uh, either on this stair or the first stair. Now, where would be the likely route onto the basement? Well, it would be one of two ways, either through the kitchen or this way through uh, what we call the butler's pantry. So you have to drop down an additional half story to get to this level of the house. You pass a door. Why couldn't or wouldn't somebody? So for all of um, Lou Smith's genius in saying, well, this is the way that the intruder got in. He got in through the basement. Why on earth would you go upstairs to get John Bonet and then take her down, downstairs past numerous doorways, glass doorways, and not just go out that way? Why would you take her back into the ba basement and then make this difficult way out of this grating? And the other thing with the grating is it's something that can really make a loud noise opening it and closing it. In fact, you can have like a real clank of this thing closing. Now, I mentioned earlier there was the sound that someone said of metal on concrete or something like that. You could, I guess, argue if you wanted to boost the intruder narrative, say, Oh, that sound could have been the grating opening and closing. But I don't think it's to say that the tinsel found in John Bonet necessarily came from the spiral staircase. I think there's another possibility. It could have come from the Christmas tree in the lounge, which is where John Bonet's body was ultimately left. It could also have come from the tinsel in either of the children's bedrooms because they had Christmas trees in both bedrooms. And the, the fourth possibility is it could have come from tinsel in the basement because that is where I think the Christmas trees were stored. So that isn't really going to help you narrow down where the crime likely happened, is it? The other thing which is quite frustrating with this description is it describes a black, red, and white hair tie, a blue hair tie, and a, a hair tie. I don't know what that's all about. The hair tie that I saw sort of had a, a leopard print. It was sort of in a the color of kind of like a brown, white, and black color. And I don't actually even see it mentioned here. So I find that quite uh, either weak or problematic, is that you can't even describe the evidence accurately in terms of this. Then I'm just going to run through a couple of other evidence items before we get to the crucial one, the Mindhunter book. So a notepad was removed, another notepad was removed, fibers from the area by the victim, fibers from the wine cellar, an avalanche sweatshirt covering the body. So that's quite interesting is that not only did John cover the body in like, a, I think, a throw, but also an avalanche sweatshirt. A blanket covering the body, wire near the body, fibers from under the body, 
white blanket in wine cellar, pink barbie nightgown from the wine cellar, broken glass from the wine cellar, hair fibers from the floor of the wine cellar. In terms of the broken glass from the wine cellar, you would say if the intruder um, broke in, you would expect something like glass would catch fibers of his clothing or DNA from his hands or arms or whatever. And none of that, that is exactly where you'd expect to find DNA of the intruder or fiber of the intruder or other evidence, and there's nothing. Then also hair fibers from the floor of the wine cellar, a broken paintbrush, wooden shards near the paint tray, a paint tray, blue paper near the rear south facing door, rope from the backyard. Then another search warrant, white string from sled, earring on street, canvas bag from crawl space, black sheet metal from wine cellar, broken purple ornament from the basement, red pocket knife with broken ornament, vacuumed fibers, felt to pen, hair fibers from the victim's pillow, hair fibers from the victim's bed, fibers from the victim's bed, fibers from the victim's pillow, vacuumed fibers from victim's bed, vacuumed fibers from victim's pillow and bedspread, Sharpie marker, hair fibers from Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey's bed, hair found in a brush in Mr. Ramsey's bathroom, Rolodex in Mr. Ramsey's desk, partially wrapped FOA Schwartz gift, partially wrapped FOA Schwartz gift, partially wrapped FOA Schwartz gift. And these are numbered 55KKY, 56KKY, 57KKY. Now, it's quite important to emphasize here that partially wrapped means it was actually wrapped and these gifts, all three of them, were slightly torn open. So in other words, it appears as if one child or two children or even three children had gone down into the basement and literally torn the wrapping off these very expensive FOA Schwartz gifts and to see what they were. And so these gifts in the basement were certainly something that was going to keep uh, Christmas children sorry, children awake on Christmas night at the end of Christmas Day. Think about it. You've still got wrapped Christmas gifts in the basement and you're a child and Christmas is coming to an end. Well, what are you going to do that night if you're a child on Christmas? Then an, a marker, 58KKY, another marker, a handwritten note, my science project from Berkshire and yellow, uh, yellow notepad from writing. Now, I just want to mention in this regard, you had fibers taken from the victim, victim's bed, fibers from the victim's pillow, also from the parent's um, bed, right, and bathroom. What about fibers from Burke Ramsey's bed? What about fibers from Burke Ramsey's pillow? Now, we know that Burke... Burke's bed was made and we don't know whether the narrative went anywhere that um, you know did did anyone go and check Burke's room really I'm talking about the crime scene text they would have found this made bed and perhaps assumed that no one actually slept in the room just like John Andrew's room the guest bedroom anyway we go on to another search warrant a pen was removed Artificial evergreen needles, comforter from the victim's bed, top sheet, bottom sheet, pillowcase, tights, bowl, spoon, glass, cotton from cellar room, angel from Christmas tree, piece of broken window, piece of broken window, piece of broken window, piece of broken window, black marker, Christmas ornaments with string, sharpie, 60 BAB, sharpie, 61 BAB, shoes, 68 BAB, notepad, sharpie, sharpie, notepad marker. Then search warrant page 12, window grate, bag containing Santa Claus Swift ornaments, Santa Claus suit, note, fingerprints of victim, fingerprints, hand drawing, birthday card, legal pad, white lined, wire tied in knot, three black markers, two pens, one marker and two pens, three large markers, five pens, one ballpoint pen, one fountain pen, brown paper, handwritten note. What is all of this telling you? All of these... Um, pens in the house, all of these writing tablets and not much writing. So although there's a ransom note found in a, the war and piece of ransom notes and there are lots of pens lying around and lots of notepads, 
they couldn't really find samples of Patsy's writing inside the the house. And they kind of actually had to go to Charlevoix to try and get other samples of it. Don't you find that kind of curious? The other thing is what these many pens, you know, one fountain pen, one ballpoint pen, five pens, three large markers, one marker and two pens, two pens, three black markers. What's that telling you? This is a family who likes to write things down. Doesn't it tell you that? Then a blouse, underwear, toilet tissue, um, toilet seat, USN OCS searches 801 book. I'm not sure what that is. Booklet, how to use Total One Security Control, AD booklet and two newspapers, girls underwear. Another search warrant, notepad with writing, one black pen, girls underwear, black pen, cigarette butts, leaves, bag, girls underwear, girls underwear, envelope with prayer book, two magazine articles, newspaper article, one magic marker, phone and address book, one Ramsey residence flyer, door from basement, one legal pad, two legal notepads, one legal notepad. Again, what all of this is reinforcing is not only do they take notes, write notes, but they also read. They are newspaper articles, magazines, and we're going to get to the next section or the next area in this, books. Anyway, there's also a letter to Santa. It's Evidence Exhibit 86 KKY. Victims Research Paper Drawings. One Felter Pen. That's Item 11 MTE. One Bike Registration. 12 MTE. One felt pen, 15 MTE, one sheet of paper, 72 BAH, one paper with names and phone number, two black felt pens, blue pair of girls' underwear. Now we go to search warrant page 14, two pair of girls' underwear, rope, one sleeping mask, framed picture of John Bonnet, broken window, framed picture of Burke and John Bonnet, one blue suitcase. Let's go on. Um, hair fibers from Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey's bed. Hair found in brush. Mr. Ramsey's bathroom. Garland. Comforters from victim's bed. Bottom. Okay, I think we've actually gone through this. Not sure if this is repeating. So, search warrant page six. Golf clubs. Pair of underwear. Velvet turtleneck. Red clay brick. Golf club cover. Towel. Tissue. Liquid from toilet. Liquid from toilet. Bear in mind there was feces in the toilet in the toilet in the basement, similar to the Amanda Knox case. Black and white tights, Charles underwear, Charles underwear, Charles underwear, black tights, black, red, green Christmas sweater, and then a vest, a shirt, trousers, garland, garland, baseball bat, item seventy four BAB, satin bow, eighty six BAB, hammer, six BAH, blue sweatpants. Bear in mind, during Burke's discussion with, um, I can't remember her name right now, Dr. What is her name? Anyway, it was on January 8th. He mentioned that perhaps a hammer was used on John Bonnet. We'll get to that in due course. Then, December 27th, search warrant. Gray sweatshirt, blouse, underwear, envelope. Envelope with carpet samples, toilet tissue, girls' underwear, men's underwear, men's pants, girls' underwear, girls' underwear, girls' underwear, gift box with black velvet, flashlight, bed sheet, five pair of five pair of girls' underwear, two pair of girls' underwear, golf club, that's item 79 BAH, black and gold blanket, one blue suitcase. The search warrant continues for December 29, computer monitor, three photos of victim, December 29, page 6, one computer disc, eight miscellaneous floppy disks, three floppy disks, one VHS tape, two VHS cassette tape, two three and a half computer disks, seven VHS videotapes, one VHS tape, three VHS videotapes, two 35 millimeter rolls of film, one Pentax camera and film, video from hallway, prodigy parcel work, 22 videotapes, 10 videotapes, Camera with three rolls of 35mm film, two computer discs, two VCR tapes, one door lock. So I just want to emphasize here the other aspect, which is the Ramses like to take photos. The Ramses had um, video cameras, normal photographic cameras, and they also watched a lot of videos. And there was uh, uh, the contention that 
The ransom note had been written by someone who watched a lot of movies, certain movies in particular, and of course in the basement were movie posters. We go on, one door lock, another door lock, 20 videotapes, two CD-ROMs, three floppy disks, one Macintosh keyboard, one modem with power cord, one computer mouse, one Macintosh computer. So another aspect that was quite strange was they couldn't really find call records from the Ramses. December 29, 9 VHS tapes, 17 VHS tapes, 13 VHS tapes, 4 or 5 VHS tapes, 1 VHS tapes, Microsoft Word manuals, 10 videotapes, 7 VHS tapes, lock, computer hard drive, Macintosh user's guidebook, Apple guide, CD-ROMs, 1 NEC disk, 1 super, super modem disk, 1 hypercard disk, Redline user's guide, 8 Macintosh systems disks, 8 Macintosh CD-ROM disks, 10 Dyson disks, 38 various computer disks, 1 video cassette, 1 computer book, 1 cassette tape, 2 CD-ROM disks and 1 computer disk, 7 CD-ROM disks and 2 computer disks. December 29th, search warrant, page 8, 6 photos, laptop computer, 2 video cassettes, 1 audio tape, 1 video cassette, 1 video cassette, 2 computer disks, Christmas card, one VHS videotape, computer disc, beta max videotape, videotape, VHS tape, NEC computer disc, Macintosh computer disc, Macintosh McWright computer disc, beta max videotape, CompuServe book, one I didn't know computer serve book, one Dave Berry cyberspace book, one VHS videotape, one VHS videotape, outer disc user's guide, two VHS videotapes, two VHS videotapes, one camera, 15 videotapes and then we go to 1997 January 30th through February another search warrant and now what they wanted was uh, and it's just we don't really know what this involved but it says Burke document Burke 1 doc 1 page Burke 2 doc 1 page Burke 3 doc 1 page Burke 4 doc 4 pages Burke 5 doc 1 page and so it goes on, up until Burke 11, three pages. Then there's also John Bernay doc, one page, one page, five pages. And anyway, it goes on and on. And then all sorts of other documents. So that is the sort of miscellaneous evidence. And in the next section in the on Patreon, we're going to be looking at the Mindhunter uh, book and of course the mind did you hear the mind hunter book coming up in all of these evidence items and the answer is no so why did the mind hunter book come up in the crime scene photos so what is quite uh, confusing